And I'm delighted to once again invite our host for this series, CEO of Mount Sinai Hospital, Joe Matt. So thank you very much. And uh, once again, it's great to have everyone in this room at Mount Sinai Hospital. It's our pleasure to have you here. Uh, Anton always uh, packs it in, but today, Minister, is standing room only. <laughs> and I think there's some TVs outside as well, so it's wonderful. Um, let me introduce the minister in this way, as opposed to credentials and your PhD and all that kind of stuff. And let me say it this way. I think that, and I think a lot of us are here also because of this, I think there is no one more suited, in my view, and I suspect with all the people in this room, uh, minister, no one more suited to lead us through this period of reformation and change over the next few years. It is my view. And the reason I say that is twofold. One is track record. I think it's a testament to you and your government, but particularly to you because it took a lot of courage when I think of the changes just over the last couple of years in terms of a generic drug strategy, in terms of the Excellent for Care uh, Act. These are, these are transformational developments which I think very, speak very well to the kinds of things and the kind of challenges and the way we do things in the future. So congratulations on that. But more importantly, and the reason you have so many partners in this room, Minister, is the, is the fact that you anchor these changes in some very, very familiar values. One of them is patient-centeredness. I know how you speak about it with passion. I know how much you care. I know you're going to visit our hospital and the way you interact uh, with our staff and our patients as well. The second one is evidence-based. I know it's very important for you, as it is for us, to make decisions on the basis of evidence uh, on the basis of, of uh, proof, and these proof of principles guide our future, and that's very important to you as well. And the last, of course, is the whole notion of healthcare as a team sport, so collaboration and integration and care continuum is important to you, and we share those values as well. So for those reasons, I can actually tell you, especially on a very important day for you, Minister, that everyone in this room is your partner, and everyone will follow you, because these are the values and the kinds of decisions that hopefully we make in our own organizations. Minister. Well, thank you so much, Joe, and good morning, everyone. This is a wonderful crowd as I look and see so many faces that have helped me understand healthcare and helped me understand the enormous untapped potential uh, in our healthcare system. I want to say thank you so much for all you do every day, all you have done for me, and for being here this morning. You, um, you know that I'm giving a little speech at noon. Um, this speech, I've never ha seen anything quite so hyped as this speech. Uh, but uh, in fact, as I was leaving the apartment building this morning, the concierge at the desk said, good morning, have a good speech. <laughs> and I said, oh, you've been paying attention, he said, I always do. So there's a certain sense of anticipation that uh, we're talking about something big today. And I do think we're talking about something big today. So I can't scoop myself. I can't tell you about all of the things that we're gonna be I'm gonna be talking about at noon. But what I did think I, uh, um, I could do this morning is kind of share with you my thoughts, what's behind the changes we're going to be talking about today and actually get your advice. So I'll talk for a little while, I'll talk about what's got my attention, and then we're gonna have a Q&A, except it's gonna be a bit different because I ask the questions and you give me the answers. <laughs> so uh, think about um, answers to questions that I may ask you. So the starting point is we have a pretty bold vision, and our vision is to make Ontario, the healthiest place to grow up and grow old. The healthiest place in North America to grow up and grow old. There's no reason why Ontario shouldn't be the healthiest place. We've got everything we need to be the healthiest place. So that's our vision, the healthiest place to grow up and grow old. We, um, we've built, since we were elected in 2003, a very strong foundation to our healthcare system. If you think back eight years ago, you can think about people who simply could not get access to primary care. You can remember wait times that were so long 
people were getting a lot worse waiting. You can think about uh, the way our ambulance system, where ambulances couldn't find a hospital to land at because there simply wasn't capacity in the hospitals. So we've spent the last eight years really building the foundation. The first thing we had to do is improve access to care. We needed more doctors. We needed, so we, and we've got more doctors, 3,400 more doctors working in this province now than in 2003. We've reversed the brain drain. There are more doctors moving to Ontario than leaving Ontario. I think last year it was 140 doctors or so, more doctors moved to Ontario then left Ontario. I actually met one of them the other day at the opening of a family health team at Liberty Village. Uh, he was an American doctor working in New York, married to a Canadian, and decided to come to Canada. He loves practicing medicine here because he, he says everyone's insured. It makes his job so much easier. So we've reversed the brain drain. We've got thousands more nurses. We've got... Uh, a remarkable increase in the number of nurse practitioners. Ontario is leading the way in the utilization of nurse practitioners who are demonstrating their, their contribution to our healthcare system. So access to care, more doctors, more nurses, and significantly lower wait times. We've cut wait times in half for those key procedures. So then we turned our attention to improving quality. And I don't want to suggest we're done on access but we've made enormous progress. Then we had turned our attention to quality of care because it became clear to me, in fact, I remember being here with Staney Brown at a breakfast with the chiefs a little while ago when we were talking about how we needed to turn our attention to improving quality of care. That poor quality care actually is very expensive care. It's not good for patients and it's not good for the system. So now we've introduced legislation, past legislation, all our hospitals now have quality improvement plans that I can tell you, I know, you probably know better than I do, but are focusing attention on improving quality of care. I think we've got tr tremendous potential um, to improve quality of care, which is part of our plan to actually reduce the costs in health care, improving quality. Health Quality Ontario is our great partner and champion in looking at evidence because we do need to move to a much more rigorous evidence-based system. Too much money is being spent on unnecessary tests, unnecessary procedures, unnecessary drugs. That's not good for patients, putting them through those unnecessary um, procedures. It's also not good for the system because it's not, it's, it's expensive care with, with limited benefit. You, um, you uh, uh, know that we are also closely linked to quality and evidence, excuse me, is we need to get better value for money. We're spending too much money on things we don't need to be spending that money on. For me, value is the intersection, intersection of quality and cost. You get higher value when you've got higher quality, you get higher value when you get lower cost. So we really need to drive value for money. We made a decision a while ago to eliminate universal vitamin D testing because there was no evidence to back up that universal vitamin D testing actually improved outcomes for patients. That savings, the savings from that one decision or $70 million, $70 million this year, we've saved on that one decision. And I know there's not a person in this room who couldn't think of a better way to spend $70 million. So making decisions based on evidence is also a really important foundation of what we need to do in, in an accelerated manner going forward. I want you to know that our government is committed to spending more in health care. We have significant fiscal challenges, you know that. But we're not going to balance our books on the backs of people who are sick. But what we are going to do is significantly reduce the increases in health care spending 
so that we can get back to balance. So as I say, we, we do have a, a significant deficit back to balance by uh, uh, 2017. It's going to require all of us working together to make that happen. But as I say, healthcare is in a privileged position because healthcare is what people really turn to the government for more than anything else. This is what we've done since we were elected. We've increased spending in healthcare year over year over year. In fact, from 2003 to now, it's a 61% increase in healthcare spending. We've bought a lot of change with that. But the point is, that rate of increase cannot continue. We will still see increases, but it will be a lower rate of increase. So how are we going to deal with my passion, the demographic challenge? So let's take a look at this. I find population pyramids fascinating. My staff tell me I'm not in the majority. Um, but, but I just want to stop and pause and talk about this, um, what you see here. You see, I, I look at population pyramids. You know that demographers have this little parlor game where they say, name the place, name the time. Here's the population pyramid. Figure out when it was, where it was. Because every population pyramid tells a story about our history. You look at the big baby boom. What was that all about? It was about people not having babies during the Depression, not having babies during the war. And then the guys come home, and look what happens. <laughs> so, so, you know, so the big baby boom, our education system, decades ago, had to change to accommodate all these new kids in school. Our healthcare system is going to have to change to accommodate the baby boomers as they grow old, as I grow old, as we grow old. So if you project from today's population to 2036, this is where I think I need to find another job. Because just look at what this tells you. So 2036, 25 years from now, we'll have more kids in the bottom. We'll have more, but not too many more, who are in that sort of 40 to 50 age range. But then look what happens as those baby boomers hit their retirement years, or that we're hitting our retirement years, as we hit the years where healthcare spending is the greatest. 20 years from now, we will have twice as many seniors as we do today. Now, I believe that a senior today isn't what a senior was, that 65 is actually pretty young. So then I focus my attention on the oldest, the, the most elderly seniors. And just look at the very top bar, that 95 plus bar an explosion of people who no doubt will require extraordinary levels of care. We'll be healthier as we age. We are healthier as we age. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean we're not going to have a significant challenge caring for the people, um, me, as we age. So that, is, um, that population period is really driving a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. I want you to know, too, before we move to that, I want, um, I, and I don't want anybody to think that this is something that's got, we've got 20 years to figure out. Because we don't. It's happening now. Every year, if you look at just people 95 and over, we've got about 80,000 people in Ontario now, age 95 and over. That number is going to grow by 10,000 every single year. So is our system operating at as good as it can be? Is it as good as it can be for those people 95 and over now? For those people 80 and over now? I don't think anybody's saying we can, we're doing the best we can do. Everybody knows we can do better caring for those elderly people. So we have to work now. Now, to bring us back out of that population pyramid I find so interesting. So I asked my, um, my officials to 
help me understand the intersection of costs and demographics. So we know we have a cost per person by age now. And then you look at the blue line is what we spend now by age. That's what we spend now by age group. So you can see we spend a lot more on people as they age, um, not surprisingly. But then if you take the same cost per person and apply it to the 20, 30, 30 population, that's what it looks like. The difference between what we spend now and what we would spend if we just did everything the same is $24 billion. $24 billion just due to that demographic change at all. To put that in perspective, it's 50% of our health care costs. So I would have to go to Dwight Duncan and tell him, for every dollar he's giving me, I want $1.50, and I'm not going to improve care. I don't think that's going to work. So we have to, simply have to, do a much better job providing better care for people as they age, better care at a lower cost. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. How, what have we learned? What have you taught me about how we can care for people outside of institutions, in their own home, where they want to be in a respectful and integrated manner? Because that's what people want. My generation, the Starbucks generation, is going to demand a certain level of care. Uh, we will have high expectations. And so not only are we going to have more of us, we're going to have higher expectations, we're going to demand more of the system. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. You know what? When, when Medicare was created back in the 60s, you know, I would say you learn a lot about Canada when you understand that when Canadians chose the greatest Canadian, they chose Tommy Douglas. Tommy Douglas, the greatest Canadian, People's Choice Award, because that's how much we value universal health care. So we've got, when, when our predecessors actually made the big step forward into universal health care, the greatest gift, in my opinion, that they gave us, we had a very different population age structure. We had a young population. We had a healthy population. Care was based on more, there was a lot more focus on episodic care than on long-term uh, chronic care, care of the complex. So as our population changes, our healthcare system has to change too. Otherwise, we could say that universal health care was an interesting experiment that failed. So for me, we have a choice. We are at a fork in the road. We can actually continue, we can either continue down the path of the status quo and end up with that $24 billion additional cost, which is unsustainable, or we can do things differently. And I'm just really excited about the opportunities we have to do things differently. We know, and Samir is here and is uh, leading, leading us down the path of providing better care for people in their own home, where they get the care they need, keeping them out of hospital, keeping them healthier longer, delaying or maybe even preventing the need to go into long-term care. We've got so much opportunity. I'm, I'm really excited about the changes ahead. This, another thing I wanted to kind of share with you was my pain. So this is how much we spend on health care, $47.1 billion. Somebody said, do you want the one in there? I said, yeah. I want the one. That one is a hundred million dollars. <laughs> so, so that's how much money we spend in healthcare. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, you know, Minister, the problem isn't that we don't have enough money in healthcare. The problem is we're spending on the wrong things. Well, I have taken that to heart. So this is how we spend on healthcare now. 35% in hospitals. 23% paying our physicians. Uh, we've got drugs, long-term care, community care, capital, other. The other is mental health. The other is public health. I don't want anybody to think the other is uh, 
minister's salary. <laughs> um, so we spend, this is how we spend our money. I will argue we don't have that balance right. I will argue that, that it's my job to rebalance how we spend our healthcare dollars so that we can make the strategic investments where we need to make them. So having said that, I think we're going to now move to answers and questions. And um, I'm going to seek your advice on how we move forward, given the reality that we all face. So thank you very much. And uh... so, Madam Minister, I'll ask the acting v uh, president of the OHA to think for a few minutes so that he, on behalf of OHA, can ask for more money. <laughs> So the first, uh, the first um, question I have for you is if you were me and your finance minister said you're going to get more money but you're not going to get a lot more money, where would the strategic decisions be? Where do you think we should be putting more money? Here's your chance. Who wants to take it? Okay, we're going to go way over the other side. Raise the stand up so I can find you. God, I'm only 32. <laughs> <laughs> Minister, thank you so much. My name is Ray Zadiever. I teach at the University of Toronto. Um, I would try to change the dialogue because we keep talking about cost benefit and where money should or shouldn't go. I'd like to see us to talk about risk benefit, appropriateness, and quality and the recognition that sometimes more is worse, not better. If you have a short wait time for something you don't need and you get side effects from it, it's 0 for 2. And if you are treated in a small hospital which doesn't have the resources needed to give you the high quality care, this is not particularly to your advantage. And is it possible to move the debate from what is the value for money to the recognition that sometimes appropriateness means you shouldn't be getting things, and can we do it that way? Absolutely. I mean, that's what excellent care for all is all about. It's about measuring outcomes. It's about looking at evidence. It's about looking at quality of care. Uh, so that is the conversation we have to have. We've started the conversation. We are implementing some of that. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but that is the question. If people are getting an unnecessary procedure, but they get it quickly, is that a success or a failure of the system? Well, I would argue it's a failure of the system. So whether it's MRIs or whether it's um, pre-op testing for things like cataracts, there are a lot of things we are spending money on that don't improve outcomes. We just can't do that anymore because we've got a lot of other demands on the system. Minister, the next question is yours. Well, I wonder if anybody else has an answer to that question. I think Gail has, a, has well, another answer. Like, uh, <laughs> nice to see you, Gail. Thank you. Hi, Gail Peach, uh, Interim CEO, Long-Term Care Association. Um, I'm, for the past um, five, six months, I've been working with long-term care and really finding it a fascinating challenge because really the way of delivering care in long-term care is not the way for the future. Um, and so to answer your question from the work that we've been doing is certainly community um, in that and long-term care being included in that. But the models of delivery of care that we have in both the community and long-term care are not the models for the future. Um, and so what needs from what we're starting to do is look at what are the new models of care that um, one, achieve the value proposition of access, quality, and cost, um, but we don't have it right yet. And so it's not dumping money into our existing models. We have to find the new models for it. Thank you, Gail. I can tell you that I've been fascinated by what I see happening in Denmark. In Denmark in the 1980s, a decision was made not to build any more long-term care homes. 
because they found they could actually serve people better in the community. So they've created a much stronger continuum of care uh, so that it's not a question the way it is really now for most people, home or long-term care. There are more options of supportive housing and palliative care, lots of other options. And that's what I think our generation is going to demand. You will recommend no more beds in Ontario. Wow, that's news. Thank you. You ready for another one? I am. The uh, chief of, uh, did you say pediatrics? Ministry of Justice. Ministry of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jory Fallis, uh, chief of family practice at East General and uh, board of the chair. Uh, at the Southeast Family Health Team. And I just wanted a couple of short uh, points. Uh, I sort of bridge between the community and the hospital. One thing, I wonder if hospitals have become oligopolies. Number two, I wonder if, if everyone looks at the Harvard Business Review this, this month, some economist at Harvard was asked, uh, what's the thing we can do in the next 10 years to help healthcare? He said, have the kitchen table talk with your loved ones. He said, most of the people that come into our hospitals haven't had a end of life or advanced care planning program. If we look for evidence, you can see in Wisconsin, I think it's called uh, Gunderson Lutheran or something. Anyways, they have the lowest hospital cost in the United States. And the reason they have it is they've had the kitchen table talk. And we're very bad at doing that. I see it every day in my work. People just haven't had the talk. And the final thing, um, I'm running for office, actually, <coughs> for the great part. But just, just to say, I highly what, recommend. I, what, what I want to say, you know, for the new 40, you look great, man. <laughs> so finally, I'm going to vote for you. I don't care what you're running for. <laughs> Liberals, is that right? I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. But the final thing I want to say is Marcus Hollander in British Columbia has got some terrific work out showing that if we plug our patients into primary care hubs, the cost for diabetes in BC has gone down by $85 million. I like what he said so much. I went out and had a meeting with him, and he's working with Barbara Starfield. He's showing over the next two years, he's going to show this with depression, osteoarthritis, and all that stuff. So my feeling is we've, we've looked at um, the hospital as the hub of how we should do care, and we have to rethink how we do that. Thank you. This has been announcement by <laughs> Thank you. I think that's terrific advice. Had a fight for the mic there. Um, if I could say, uh, Marcus Hollander is all over Longwoods.com, whereas probably you read him. He's a, a very, very well-read thinker that, uh, that we published, and a nice guy to boot yet. Barbara Starfield, by the way, just recently passed away, so he'll be representing her. But. That's true, I believe she was. Yeah. So your question, Madam Minister. I've got another hand up here, let's see. All right, would you introduce yourself when I give you the mic? Hi, I'm Teresa from Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm uh, in internal audit. But I'm, uh, I have a question as a, as a user of healthcare in Ontario. I think most of us, I for a fact, do not know what the actual cost of uh, of healthcare is, and I think uh, I think what Ontario needs to work on is making more responsible users. Like I mean, we don't have that information. We don't have the data to know um, when a, when a procedure might be unnecessary or what it's costing the province. And I think we need to do a better job of actually relaying the cost um, that that uh, you know that per per user, per, per citizen, is actually incurring. I think it will make a difference in the way we actually um, uh, manage our health. Well, thank you for that advice. I can tell you that it comes up from time to time because you, know, you don't get the bill the way you do in the States, for example. Um, so I've actually inquired about it because I think it's kind of an interesting question. If I told you that the cost of adjusting our systems to make that possible was in the hundreds of millions of dollars, would you still think that's a good use of, of money? That's really, that's really the question, because it's hard to capture those costs. And I, for one, am not 
keen on embarking on a new computer program till we get some more done of what we've already embarked on. I hear what you're saying. Oh, hello, Thank Eileen. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm Eileen bad. Pepler. I'm with I Richard Ivey School of Business. I'm wondering, $47.1 billion is a lot of money for health. Does that does not include the delivery costs from other sectors? So, i.e., um, children and youth services, seniors, housing. So I'm wondering if you're looking at a health care model that is cross-sector and includes all levels of government to deliver the new ways forward. Well, thank you, Eileen. And for those of you who don't know Eileen, she's done some groundbreaking work on uh, children's mental health in particular that is really uh, has shone a light on some of the ex significant inefficiencies in that system. You know, uh, Eileen raises, of course, the really important question about, and I, I think you're particularly talking about people with pretty complex needs, uh, people with mental health challenges, people with complex needs who um, access not just the healthcare system, but also social services and housing and uh, the police and the court system. And uh, uh, there is no question that we need to move to a system where there is a lot more responsibility taken for a whole person. Many of you have probably heard me talk about Million Dollar Murray before, but I'm going to do it again. Million Dollar Murray is an article that was written by Malcolm Gladwell a few years ago. It was published in New Yorker magazine. And when I read that article, it inspired me to think about how do we do this differently. So Murray is a fellow who is a Vietnam vet, uh, some mental health and addiction challenges, the most lovable man you could imagine. Everyone who came in contact with him quite adored him. Uh, he died when he was, if my memory serves me right, 54 years old. He was homeless and, uh, and died an unnecessary death. At his wake, there were all sorts of service providers who gathered because they loved him so much. And I imagine after a drink or two, started adding up what did the system spend on Murray? And they sort of added each sector, adding the cost, adding the cost, adding the cost. When they got to a million dollars, they just stopped counting. The point was, if you've got a million dollars to spend on Murray, in our jails, in our courts, in our various parts of our system, if you've got a million dollars to spend on Murray, after the fact, what could we possibly do with that money if we spent it before? the fact, proactively. And it was a real call to action on housing for, um, for people with uh, mental health and addictions challenges. So that Million Dollar Murray inspires me and inspires my colleagues to really do a much, much better job with those folks to really wrap the services around them. Because too much of our system, whether it's child welfare or you, know, you name it, is really spent unnecessarily because nobody was there early. Good morning, Minister Camille Orange. Oh, Toronto good morning, Central Camille. Um, the answer, for me, the answer to your question, some of it we have heard. But if I look at your pie chart, mm -hmm. every single player in that chart has a accountability to one organization or one sector. And it's not just how we move money around those sectors. It's how do we hold every player in the sector accountable to each other and the patient and the outcome. And that goes across healthcare and across what the previous speakers just talked about, across ministries. And I, to, to date, I still haven't heard the conversation about joint accountability for outcome to the patient. So every sector have really good arguments, work really hard, but is, in, is vested in, ret, in retention. And I think we need to also add another discussion to the dialogue we have to change models, but we have to hold everybody accountable to a collective outcome. I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. You know, um, George Smitherman used to talk about every morning he would walk to work and he would see 
the same woman in the same bus shelter appeared to be a homeless woman. He said that woman is getting care from a lot of different government-funded providers. A lot of people are responsible for a little bit of that person, but who is responsible for the well-being of that individual? And the answer was and still is no one. So I think you're absolutely right. If we get, if we change things to, uh, to actually hold someone responsible, not just for a certain part of the body or a certain narrow piece of that person, but for the whole person, we could go a whole lot further. So anybody else want to answer that particular question? If you remember what it was. Over here. Uh, or any other advice you have to offer. And your name is C.O. Me. Where are you from, C.O.? I'm with the Ontario Public Health Association. Hi, Minister Matthews. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, I wanted to um, maybe offer advice from the public health sector. You had said that uh, we fall under the 14 point uh, something percentage. And uh, like you, I do love looking at population pyramids. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the answers um, fall in the area that um, public health has taken responsibility of, especially around health prevention, uh, prevention, promotion, and wellness. I think especially in regards to the seniors, we talk a lot about that percentage that enters into the health care system, but there's also that huge percentage that could remain healthy and stay at home. And the role that prevention, promotion um, would have, especially building this concept of resiliency amongst seniors, we certainly take care of that amongst the ch child health sector, we, we help to build a resiliency piece. I think as well, you know, the population pyramid current uh, against our historic pieces, you know, we, we see how it'll look in 2030, but with this childhood obesity concern, that pyramid will change, I suspect, and um, we'll see a, a sense, a spike in that middle age group going into the healthcare system. And I think that continued focus on health prevention promotion, perhaps, more substantive investments in those areas and I think even the role that public health could play um, would be an answer really a, a substantive part of your solution in the near future in terms of decreasing the health care spending but also really having substantive value for money at the end of the day for health spending dollar not just health care and I think the last piece the, the millionaire the millionaire Mary is the issue of health equity and the lens that we need to, need to apply in the different parts of um, the government sector spending. Um, you know, our advice is that in public health, we are very much linked to other parts of the social services sector because we see the role that housing and income and poverty and all those related social services have on health care and health. And I think that applying and needing to encourage a health lens is, is really key to that. Well, that's my answer and thank you very much. That's terrific advice and there's nothing you said that I disagree with. You know, I'm told that 25%, uh, uh, some people tell me 33% of what we spent on health care is spent on completely preventable illness if people stopped smoking, got more exercise and ate more healthy, healthily. So, you know, that whole health promotion piece is huge. And you're absolutely right, the child obesity numbers are um, demand action. And uh, we are going to be moving on a child obesity strategy. We've set ourselves a pretty audacious goal, reduce child obesity by 25% over five years. We're going to have to work really hard to achieve that, but, uh, but that is work that uh, we're going to undertake. We'll need a lot of help with that. Thank you very much. Minister Graham Show from Canadian Blood Services, thank you for your remarks this morning and look forward to your remarks at lunchtime. Uh, Razor challenged you to change the debate in, in one way and I would uh, like to challenge you to change it in, in a slightly different way but an equally important one and it builds on what the Premiers uh, spoke about in the recent meeting in Victoria and this notion of looking at collaboration and integration of health care but importantly across provincial boundaries and I'd like to give you one current example and one proposed example that I think can help slow the rate of increase of healthcare delivery in provinces without challenging constitutional issues. The first one is national pharma care and the debate has gone on in this country for far too long and not least of which is this notion that provinces can't collaborate with each other in, in pharmaceutical acquisition and distribution 
And I'd like to remind you and, and many others in this room here that there exists a functional model of national pharmacare today called Canadian Blood Services. We're the only agency that acquires and distributes pharmaceuticals on behalf of all the provinces uh, in a single uh, institution, organizational and governance structure. And you cited the example of vitamin D saving Ontario some money. Uh, we recently went to international tender to purchase drugs for hemophilia care for all the provinces and territories in Canada, and in a single contract have effectively reduced the cost of haemophilia care by $170 million over the next seven years because we are purchasing the drugs on a pan-Canadian, multi-provincial, national basis as the single contract, and in fact are the largest purchaser of haemophilia drugs worldwide. So this notion of delivering services in an integrated, multi-provincial fashion really does need to be looked at. And the proposed solution, building on that strategy that Canadian Blood Services has, we have in front of your government and all governments now a strategy for a pan-Canadian organ and tissue donation and transplantation system for Canada, which will leave the delivery of health care at the provincial level, but is premised on multi-provincial collaboration and decision-making. And the strategy sitting in your ministry now, along with your colleague ministries across the country, will save Ontario its share of $974 million over the next 10 years if we do organ donation and transplantation on a pan-Canadian basis. And the very first initiative that we implemented was a pan-Canadian kidney rib, which has allowed Ontario to do 34 transplants in the last six months that it otherwise would not have been able to do on its own. Those patients are now off lifelong dialysis. The point, Minister, is I think one of the debates we need to look at is delivery of services in a multi-provincial, shared and collaborative fashion while still resulting in provinces owning the delivery of services. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, and I do think there's uh, terrific potential in taking a pan-Canadian approach. Uh, you'll know that the Premier's um, a year and a bit ago actually embarked on pan-Canadian purchasing for drugs and uh, that is not as simple as it sounds as you know uh, but we actually have had our first success we had a pan-Canadian purchasing agreement for uh, the drug Solaris and uh, we are work continuing to, to work together at a pan-Canadian level on, um, uh, on, on new drugs uh, that are uh, that are coming into the formulary. So we are, we do think there's potential, some potential for Ontario, probably because Ontario is just as big as it is, the, the benefits will benefit all Canadians and uh, perhaps a little bit less proportionally for Ontario, but I, I don't care. I mean, we're all in this together. So are there opportunities at a pan-Canadian level? Absolutely. I want you all to know that I'm really trying not to say how disappointed I was when the Prime Minister backed away from any conversation on the future of Medicare, I wouldn't say that. But, um, <laughs> but I want you to know I'm trying, I'm trying hard not to say that. I have to go away over to the other side, Minister. Damn this is your workout this morning, awesome. hey? I'm glad there's a doctor, a pediatrician in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> And more than that, Anton, there's lots of nurses here. So, <laughs> yay! Yay! Uh, Kathy Zabo, Community Care Access Center, Central High Hi, Matthews. I think what I'd like to do is offer the government this bit of advice. Treating or preventing illness is different from treating chronic disease, is different from an acute episode of care. And one um, strategy will not fit all. And treating along disease trajectories is different from keeping people well and managing the broader determinants of health. So I think um, I would encourage different models, as Gail mentioned earlier on, different partnerships going forward to move to that integrated care delivery system because each outcome you want to have for an individual patient who trusts us every time they walk in these doors to give them the best possible care is different. Thank you, Kathy. It's always safe to go to academe, I think, don't you, Minister? So, That's Brian Golden? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So this is probably the first time I've been handed a mic when I wasn't expecting it and <laughs> was, wasn't looking forward to it. Um, what I suppose I'll say is um, over the last six months, uh, to your ministry's credit, it's given a great deal of attention to uh, the primary care challenges. Uh, and there were five reports uh, written that Susan Fitzpatrick asked uh, to have put together. And I think many of us were struck by how far ahead other jurisdictions were in primary care, um, but how much opportunity there is to do, uh, to, to develop an effective primary care strategy. And that work uh, is probably moving somewhere through your offices. And I hope it will get a great deal of your attention. Uh, there was a multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral contribution to that. And we were all very optimistic with the work that came out of it. Real challenges getting groups together and getting the uh, incentives aligned. But there is great work right now that is sitting in the ministry. Uh, and I suspect very close to your desk. And I hope uh, that's where you'll uh, spend some real attention over the next few months. Thank you, Brian. I, I just do want to talk a little bit about primary care because I think um, we haven't focused enough attention. We've we focused a lot of attention on getting um, getting more people access to primary care, but there's a whole lot more we can do to give primary care physicians the tools they need to really be the champion for that person when it comes to their health care. Um, you know, I, my parents are both. Uh, They'd kill me if they heard me say this. They're both elderly. They're both well into their 80s. Um, and they, you know, I was reading an ISIS study recently. They, they, 75 percent of complex seniors that they uh, looked at, 75 percent uh, were getting care from six or more physicians. Six or more physicians looking after one person, each possibly prescribing different drugs. Uh, each off, uh, proposing different tests, and nobody was really in charge of pulling together all that care uh, and look at the whole person, not just different parts of their body. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity for, uh, for primary care, physicians, nurse practitioners, the full um, uh, interdisciplinary team approach that I, I really think there's a big opportunity to do more when, when it comes to primary care. Who was it that put their hand up? Where was that? Now you're next. Who else was it? They checked it out. No. Ladies and gentlemen, the interim <coughs> president of the Ontario Hospital Association. Thank you, Anton. Good morning. Good morning. We're happy to be here today. Um, a few things. First of all, let's start with um, the, I'm not sure it was a shot across the bow from Anton, but uh, more a uh, <laughs> challenge about asking for money. Um, on behalf of hospitals in Ontario. I won't be doing that, Minister. Uh, at least not this morning. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and I think it's important to, to continue to point out that the Ontario Hospital Association's view is that, as you mentioned, the need to rebalance is uh, a key element to the continued uh, evolution and positive development of the healthcare system. But as you know, there are many moving parts. And there are many indicators that people will talk to you about that might um, try to protect the status quo. One of the indicators that hospitals might use, for example, is the fact that Ontario, uh, on an internationally comparative basis, has the lowest admission rate of any OECD country, Canada rather, and Ontario leading that, uh, that, that uh, um, I think, development over the last number of years. The issue, though, is how do you get from where we are to where, we're going, where we need to be? And the uh, question of decision making, so we're not making those decisions by wedge, but we're making those decisions in an integrated fashion, and it builds in part on the question that Camille, or the comment that Camille raises. If you were to sort of project out the five years and describe the narrative as you would like to see it in five years about how not only we make decisions together, the process side, but what's the what? Like, how would the system look different in five years if your vision as you're outlining it today takes hold? Well, thank you, Mark, for that uh, big question. And let me, let me do my best. 
when I look at our healthcare system from sort of a bird's eye view, what I see is a lot of extraordinarily talented, committed people working in our healthcare system, um, doing a superb job at what they do. What I see, where the gaps are, though, is in those transitions from one to another, from one setting to another, a handoff from hospital back to home. There, the, the gaps is where our problems are, in my opinion. Um, not to say everything else is perfect, but the biggest glaring um, challenges we have are how do we bridge those gaps so that we actually follow a patient's journey through the healthcare system. I think we can do a whole lot better if we're all aware that our job isn't just within our narrow piece of the pie, but also in a safe um, and healthy transfer to the next level of care. So I think there's a whole lot of work we need to do to, um, uh, to get us thinking that way and to put in place the incentives, financial incentives, to get us to behave that way. So when I look at hospitals and I see an ALC rate, what's our provincial ALC rate now? 15%? It's about 4,000. 4,000 people. 4,000 people today are in a hospital bed who don't need to be in a hospital bed, who don't want to be in a hospital bed, who are in a hospital bed because our system has not built the capacity outside a hospital. So for me, that, that tells me the problem is we don't have enough beds. The problem is we've got the wrong people in those beds. So that requires a big change. And I'm, I'm really excited by some of the examples I've seen as I've traveled the province and actually seen home first at work, uh, more intensive supports at home work. I mean, there's a lot of really good stuff happening, but it's still the exception, it's not the norm. So five years from now, what I really hope to see is much, much smoother, safer uh, transitions between care. The days where people are discharged into a void should be behind us. And Madam Minister, the last question goes to a nurse. Leslie Thompson, CEO of Kingston. Thank you very much. And um, my question, or my response in terms of the, the one piece that's missing that we haven't talked a lot about this morning is the focus on the patient that needs to move beyond lip service of talking about a patient-centered system and really cultivating the dialogue, the conversation, and the meaningful engagement of patients and families in the transitions that we will be undertaking over the next number of years so that patients and families are really well-informed and active um, engaged because my experience is that we continue to be surprised when creating that engagement with the kind of choices that they, and the directions that they will guide us in that we may not have thought of before. And I think it's time that we really move beyond just talking about it, and there's lots of really interesting examples and good work that's happening to systematically build in and support um, patients and families as part of the change and so that five years from now, the people that are really uh, standing tall and saying we've got the system we need are the patients and families, and that gets us, moves us more out of the politics, moves out of the silos, and teaches us as caregivers, as nurses, physicians, and as administrators a new lens to guide the choices that we're going to make, and I'd encourage us to um, put some examples in place of, of actually making that real because that will bring the vision that uh, you've spoken about to life in a whole new way. What a perfect way to end. Thank you, Leslie. So, Madam Minister, someone whispered to me while I was in the audience, the best minister we've ever had. Uh. <laughs> Well, thanks for setting up this new style for us. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's great. But the other thing you're doing with this whole new program that you're announcing at lunch is we will have speakers coming in for the next while to respond. So the next response comes from a primary care doc, uh, Daniel Martin, who you probably know. 
uh, together with a, a doc, no, sorry, not a doc, a CEO uh, from Brampton, Matt Anderson. They're going to get together and they're going to uh, give, uh, give you their point of view. So look for that. You're all invited to that particular breakfast with the chiefs. Like to thank you. Maybe I could say you have the dedicated response from this audience to make it work. Thank you for coming to breakfast with the chiefs. <laughs>